How do you, is it maestra? Is it maestra? How do I pronounce it? Say it. I answered to anything, maestra or maestro, both, both work for me. I like maestro. I don't know. It's kind of personal. Maestra. Yeah. That's what I thought. Like my probably wants to be maestro. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, maestra, for, for being on the podcast. I've read and uh, that each conductor has his or her own style of conducting. Is it fair? I'm sure because conducting is a metaphor really for who you are as a human being. And everyone has a different, a different body language, a different way to gesture and a different way to exist in the world. So I think it really is a very, it, it, there aren't, there isn't a formula and there's not a cookie cutter kind of uh, approach. So I think that's what I love about conducting. It's very individualistic and it's very much who you are as a human being. How would you describe your style? Oh, I don't know. Gosh, I, you know, I think, uh, I think again, uh, as a person, I'm, um, I'm, I've got a lot of energy. Um, I, I want, I want to things to be at a high level. I'm passionate. Um, but I think, you know, I'm not really flashy. Um, I'm, I make friends slowly. That's the kind of person I am and my friendships last forever. So it's a it's a different kind of um, approach, you know, but I think the most important thing about conducting is to be true to who you are and and always be authentic. When you listen to other conductors without seeing who's conducting, can you tell? Sometimes. And it's primarily because of uh, because of what? Tempo, color of the orchestra, sound quality. Um, big interpretive arch, that kind of thing. I can almost, not always, but I can almost always tell when it's my teacher, Leonard Bernstein, almost always, because he's so distinctive. And there's so much thought behind his choice of tempo or his choice of phrasing. So I can often tell when it's him. And that choice of tempo, is it... Um, is there like a range where you can, can or cannot go? Like, is there, because technically you're playing, you, you conveying the message of the uh, composer, right? Correct. Isn't there like guidance from compose, a composer what the tempo should be? Yes, you know, there are, <clears throat> so there are, there are tempo, you know, indications, which is a general, it's more of a, a, a general feeling. So if it says allegro con brio, that means fast with, with a little bit of fire, you know? So how fast is fast with fire, you know, with <laughs> energy? So that's up for interpretation. But starting in Beethoven's time, composers had access to this new um, technology called the metronome. Yeah. So they could put metronome indications and Beethoven does that in all of his uh, works um, and all of his symphonies have metronome markings for each uh, movement and so that's a really helpful indicator um, because it it enables it enables the conductor to have a, a very direct conversation uh, or indication from the composer I try to be relatively <clears throat> true to Beethoven's tempo markings. Um, some people think they're fast, but of course you also have to take into account the size of the orchestra today, which is much bigger, mm -hmm. the size of the concert halls today, which are much bigger, the need to project all the way to the back of the hall. All of these things influence one's choice of tempo. But I think the fundamental choice has to be as true to the composer's intentions as possible. But sometimes they don't put a metronome, so you have a lot more leeway. As a conductor, how do you choose your repertoire? You know, I think repertoire changes over the course of a career. Um, when I started, I focused a lot on American music, um, particularly the moment in American music where jazz, where serious and popular music come together. I love mm -hmm. jazz. So that was a, a, a passion of mine. And, you know, I revived a lot of 
things by Gershwin, by James P. Johnson, these composers who, who's, some of whose works had been lost. So that was a very good way for me to start. And then that evolved into my interest in American contemporary music. So I made a name for myself in that arena of repertoire. And then once I started getting engagements in you, with that repertoire, they would say, what would you like to do when you come back? And then of course I would say, I'd, I'd like to do Brahms please, because that's another passion. Mm -hmm. So repertoire is an evolution for a conductor. And of course, then, you know, I've, I've recorded all the, um, uh, on video, all the Mahler symphonies now. And, you know, so it, your repertoire really develops, but I always tell young conductors, you know, there are worse things than being known as a specialist for something because it's a good way to at least get your foot in the door and get in front of some orchestras. And then if they like you and they re-engage you, you can do more variety of repertoire. When you go from Baltimore Orchestra to Vienna to Sao Paulo, do you use the same repertoire or you try to adjust to that culture and bring something from? That's a great question. I think it's, I think it's a little bit of both. Um, I try to keep some major pieces for a season with me but the repertoire in Vienna is very very different from Baltimore or Sao Paulo it's a it's a radio orchestra so there's a big commitment to music of today and particularly European and Austrian contemporary music which is a completely different profile from anything I do anywhere else and so then in Sao Paulo also um, they have a big commitment as you would expect to Brazilian music Mm -hmm. So I try to I try to work that into my repertoire there. And I've been able to bring several Brazilian pieces actually to American orchestras and they love them. So it's a nice um, it's a nice way of trying things. But it's not as though I take one program and then I just go around with it. Not at all. It's it's a much more varied um, approach. What's your creative process like from let's say from the moment you selected new symphony is it symphony how, how it's said to mm -hmm. play yep so mm -hmm. you just pick up those score do you how do you go through that do you research other orchestras that already played it or you prefer not to oh well certainly uh, at some point i i will i mean i'm sitting here with a pile of scores this big on my let me see if you can see it oh, i don't think you see because of the light but i have a pile of scores i'm working my way through um and uh, you know it depends when I'm doing a standard repertoire piece that is familiar, you know, that's a different approach from a new piece that I've never seen. And maybe it doesn't even have a recording of it yet. But the approach that I take is always similar. I'm trying to find out uh, the motivation of the composer. Why did this person write this piece? What's the story? What's the narrative behind the piece? So this is my, my big um, investigation, I would say. I'm trying to discover this. So it's a matter of looking at the score, analyzing harmonically, analyzing melodically, analyzing the phrases, analyzing the dynamics, you know, trying to figure out what, and gradually as I do that, and as I read about the composer or speak to the composer, if it's a living composer, I start to, it starts to take a shape. You know, it's sort of a blob and then it starts to shape and you see, ah, okay, this is the picture that I need to convey to my musicians so they can convey it to the audience. So you're looking at the score and you actually hear the music? Is it? How? Yes. Mm -hmm. That's insane. Okay. I, I, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, that's great. It's pretty crazy. I mean, I don't know how much, I don't know if we could measure how much a conductor hears, but I think we hear a lot. Um, and of course, the more you do it, the more facile you become with it. And, uh, um, you know, I can generally look at a score and have a pretty decent idea of how it will sound. Um, but I don't think I'm hearing everything. I'm not sure that's physically possible. And then you take that uh, interpretation and you go to your orchestra and you tell, okay, now you guys are playing this or girls, right? Is it like a yeah, sheet music? Not maybe? exactly like that, but, you know, <laughs> you go to the orchestra, you know, and you say... Um, 
you know, it's such a privilege to be here. <laughs> you know, you, you have to, you have to really have the right dynamic going between you. Um, and usually I say, if it's a new piece, uh, and the composer can be there, I say, you know, please welcome our guest composer. And I've asked him or her to say a few words about the piece, you know, to try to give the musicians some insight. And if they're not there, I'll say a few words. Uh, this is a piece that was written to commemorate this or in honor of that, or, you know, to a childhood memory, whatever it is. And it gives the musician sort of a, a little snapshot. Okay. You know, it's like saying, okay, this, we're thinking about blue, the color blue, you know, we're all thinking about the same thing. And then, uh, then I start to work it through and I don't just play things. I, I like to play a chunk so they have an idea and then work it through and take things apart and show the musicians uh, where they're together with whom. And, you know, so you start, they start getting a sense of the piece as well. So for them, it's, it's the second step, you know, where they have a blob in front of them, just these, you know, black notes on the white page. And then they start taking the shape of something. And, and that's how it goes. And it's a very fast process though, once you get with the orchestra, my study process is much longer, you know, several months often wow. or several weeks. And then the orchestra, I often meet the orchestra for the first time on a Tuesday morning. And our first concert is Thursday evening. That has to go quickly. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's quick. Okay. Wow. Well, you're obviously one of the most accomplished uh, conductors uh, today, but your life story is fascinating. Like you, you were born in New York with a fa uh, musician family, right? What did you learn right. from your parents? Oh gosh, you know they they wanted to share their passion for music with me, and I, I think. I think that's what I picked up from them, that music is a, it's not just um, something that one does, it's part of the air, it's part of the water, it's, you know, it's part of your blood. <laughs> so I think that's what I picked up from them. Um, and also my parents were very, they were very scrappy people who, you know, they came from very modest, um, if not poor uh, backgrounds and, and they, they managed to put together wonderful lives um, and music was the vehicle really. There were no female conductors back then. How did you decide to become no, one? No, there, there might have been one or two, but I didn't have any exposure to them. Um, but I saw um, my dad took me to a concert. I was already playing violin. I had played piano and I was playing violin. Um, and I was at Juilliard pre-college already by the time I was nine. And uh, my dad took me to a concert and, oh, I fell in love with the conductor. <gasps> I said, oh, man, this guy is so cool. And he talked to the audience and he was jumping around. And I said, you know, dad, this classical music thing has been a little bit worrying me. But if I'm the conductor, I can have fun. So I <laughs> want to do this. So that's and it was Leonard Bernstein. And Leonard Bernstein and over your music career as a student you heard I think you, you said your violin teacher once told you that girls don't conduct right right one day you start working with Leonard Bernstein Bernstein sorry if he told you the same thing that women or girls don't conduct how do you think your career would be different if at all oh I think that would have been devastating I I, and, you know, fortunately, that wasn't his attitude at all. His, he was a very open-minded person. But, you know, I also spoke with um, Sylvia Kaduf, who's a, a, a conductor. She is a couple generations before me. She's now in her 80s. And she studied with Herbert von Karajan, who you would think would say, absolutely not. Women can't conduct. Forget it. But that's not at all what he said. He said, come and study with me. And he became like a father mentor figure to her. So these people that you think are going to be very opposed and very conservative, they end up being actually much more open-minded. And um, I think that that was, that was very important for me because Bernstein was my hero. And he was a great advocate for me and a great supporter. I don't think he understood it. 
very well. I think he was a little bit confused, like, how can women do this? Because he's from that generation, you know, that didn't didn't have that expectation. But he tolerated me. Well, yeah, that and it turned out great, right? <laughs> You've accomplished a lot in the in music. When looking back, what do you think was your what's a, what are you proudest of? Oh, that's a great question. Um, you know, I would say probably I'm I'm most proud of my son, who he dabbles in music, but he's just a, a good human being. I'm happy to bring a good human being into the world. Um, and in music, I would say that, you know, I'm I'm proud of all of my recordings and performances, all those things. But I'm probably most proud of the two programs I founded, the Orchids program in Baltimore for um, for kids, disadvantaged kids to play musical instruments and the fellowship I started for women conductors, the Taki Alsop Conducting Fellowship, because these are programs that have a long life mm -hmm. and they can really support people who need the support, young, talented artists. And they can change lives. So I, I feel the most proud of those two programs. There is a fascinating documentary about, about you, and I really su suggest everyone watch it because there are so many questions I would love to cover. I know you. Uh, we don't have time for that. You, you have to run. But one last question I have is, you told me what you learned from your parents. If I ask your son what he learned from you, what do you think he would say? I was thinking he would say to be true to himself. Got it. Oh, thank you, Maestro.